Okay, so hello friends, uh, welcome to Urbanus podcast. Uh, I'm the host Donatus Urbanus and uh, this time on my weekly podcast uh, I'm joined by the little unexpected guest, a little ex- unexpected co-host uh, I would say and it is Eric McCollum, uh, Lokomotiv Krasnodar guard. Welcome on the show. Uh, thank you for having me. I actually had you uh, on Urbanus interview edition uh, before the season, uh, but this time we have to emphasize that this is not going to be an interview. This is going to be a basketball conversation, and Eric will join me as the co-host uh, of the pod. And I know that our combo might sound weird to you because Eric never played for Lithuanian club. Uh, we met each other just in September during the preseason Uh Eric is still active player. He's from States. I am from Lithuania. So we don't have a lot of uh, in common. But uh, I remember we were having that interview. And for me, it was a very quality, very entertaining interview. Uh, and I remember Eric mentioned that uh, when he will retire, he will be seeking, although I thought that he will be seeking a head coaching career. Uh, but uh, <laughs> he was talking, you were talking about uh, analyst, uh, probably I would say analyst job in, in States, talking about the NBA, about the game in general. And uh, I thought that, yeah, that's a good idea because when I made the research uh, about you, uh, preparing for my podcast, you, you checked so many um, boxes. Uh, for example, uh, the, the way you approach uh, um, games, the way you approach uh, practices, the way you're grinding, uh, the way you know European basketball, for example. You follow a lot of European basketball, including EuroLeague, uh, EuroCup. You played on whole different levels. You won the EuroCup. Uh, you played in EuroLeague. You were the MVP of the EuroCup. So I thought that, yeah, maybe maybe that's a great idea and especially to have you here on European Basketball Podcast. So I'm, I'm really happy to have you over there and I'm super happy that you... You didn't even hesitate, just like shooting. You, you're not hesitating, <laughs> and you're kind of accepted the invitation, as as I asked you this. Yeah, we had such a good time the first go around, and you know I liked your energy. You know, I liked some of the topics. And I figured, why not? You know, why not join a podcast and you know give a glimpse of you know another part of you know us athletes. Yeah, and today we will discuss. Uh, we will have some main topics, including uh, Anadolu Efes and their chances to repeat uh, the EuroLeague Championship run and to defend the crown. Also, the renaissance of Monaco after the head coaching change, and we will talk these three Russian teams, which are currently on the top eight uh, at the moment, which is historical thing I would say. And then we have some other topics around, and I will start with a personal question. Uh, In the last seven games, Eric McCollum was averaging 27.5 points per game, including five EuroCup matches and a 33-point performance against Partizan uh, in Loco's win. That's just unfair, Eric, to be honest. But uh, just <laughs> just let me... Uh, can you give a shout-out? Uh, I will ask you this in a different way. Can you give a shout-out to the best defensive presence you ever faced in your life or, let's say, Uh, who was the best def- one-on-one defender who took the best out of you and who kind of managed to contain you? See, this is going to be a, a funny answer because most people would expect me to answer with a guard, um, somebody that guards me one-on-one, whatever the case may be. But the toughest defender, and I said it before he came onto the stage, before he was known in Europe, before he was a hot name, is John Brown. Um, okay. He's unbelievable on a pick-and-roll defense. He's everywhere on the court. Um, he's helping. He's rotating. Um, he's pretty much uh, the Euro lead version of uh, Draymond Green. And it sounds funny, but everywhere he's on the court, I'm trying to locate him. I'm trying to find him. He'll break off defensive plays. He doesn't do what you expect him to do. And athletically, he can guard one through five. So when we played Unix, it was extremely difficult just to use my pick and roll action and to come off aggressive in the paint. He's helping. He's everywhere. So. John Brown is it, his hands down. He he's an elite defender, and I think now the world finally gets to see it. Yeah, I think that uh, you actually had your single, uh, your only single um, digit game in terms of points against Unix Kazan. Uh, so probably John John had that impact, you know, for your lowest scoring game of the season. Oh yes, for sure. I I can be man enough to admit it. It was tough. You know, I look forward to the next meeting. You know, I've made some adjustments. I've been watching a lot of Unix games. You know, fool me once, you know, you know, good job. Fool me twice, 
and that's my fault. So I'll be ready for the next one. <laughs> yeah, we, we will talk about John uh, definitely later in our podcast. But there's another impressive, uh, at least one more impressive uh, guy on Locomotive's roster, and it's uh, John Motley. Uh, he, he was just dominating the poll or the GM survey, uh, which was published by EuroCup last week, and. Uh, in the GM survey, Motley uh, was voted as the most spectacular player, the MVP front runner, and the player they would like to sign even before Kevin Punter. And he is averaging 21.2 uh, points per game this year on 65% uh, two-point shooting, seven rebounds, 24 performance index rating, and he's first in true shooting percentage, first in points, first in index rating, first in offensive rebounds, second in blocks, second in foul drops. Second and free throws made, third and total rebounds. I mean, that's just insane. And I just wanted to use this opportunity to ask you, what makes him so special? What he's like off the court and uh, what made him so special on the court? Because he's just, you know, he's making his debut in, in Europe before he had some short stints with uh, uh, Dallas and LA Clippers. He had some impressive games. He had one game, uh, I think it was season 2017-18. He had 26-point performance, 12 rebounds. Uh, against the against Detroit Pistons, I think, but you know his path was different. He he went to play in South Korea before joining uh, Locomotive. What made him so special this year? I think Jonathan Motley has the unique blend of athleticism, of mobility, and um, skill that you don't usually see on a big man. Like this is a guy who's six foot nine, um, who, who can run like a guard, who can stop on a dime, change direction in traffic who dunks anything around the basket. I mean, he's shooting 65%, and it's not all layups and dunks, which is what he is extremely talented with. But he can also make the mid-range shot, and he's shown the propensity to be able to hit the three-point shot. But I think with, with Motley, it's, it's a matchup nightmare for bigs, just because even when they press, sometimes uh, we use them as a press relief. Um, kind of like we lose, uh, like Milan uses Kyle Hines. He brings the ball up to court. He breaks the press. He initiates it. These are things you don't see in Europe. A five-man initiate the offense, setting the screen, popping or rolling, and the ability to switch one through five. And I think that's what has most of Europe salivating at the mouth to try to sign Jonathan Motley. And I know um, everybody wants him. I'm hoping that, you know, we can keep him if I'm back here. But, you know, he's just a special talent. Yeah, I remember uh, I f the first time I saw him, uh, for sure it was in Kaunas, be because you had your preseason training camp here in Lithuania. He was dominating uh, Jalgiris. Then I saw him in Gloria Cup in, in, in Turkey. And I rem remember there were a lot of NBA scouts, uh, a lot of basketball people around uh, in the building. And they were talking that this is the next big thing in Europe, that uh, a lot of big teams will be after him. And even since September, he was already a big name uh, on the market. And uh, at least I hope that you will manage to keep him uh, until the end of the season. Probably it will happen. But after that, it will be very hard. And uh, I was thinking that uh, there are two things I want to say about uh, Motley. The first one is that uh, he still can improve a lot in a way uh, how he could avoid uh, foul trouble. Because sometimes he's just dominating games. Uh, with his energy, with his physicality, as I mentioned, all the other uh, skills he brings on the court. But it seems like he's still just trying to f uh, learn um, the level of contact which is allowed here in Europe. Sometimes he has four fouls and he uh, makes some stupid fifth foul just to keep him uh, on the court for a longer time. So as soon as he will man manage to, let's say, um, to improve in this area, and it, I think that it will happen uh, with some time, it's it's natural for the European rookie to adjust in, in terms of officiating. He will be uh, even a better player. And what I w just wanted to add that uh, there were a lot of and there are a lot of uh, very talented U.S. players here in Europe. But to keep uh, to be consistent uh, on a daily basis, to be so dominant, you need some good partners. And uh, I, I have to admit, without any as kissing or something that it was very important for John to have you as a mentor and as a guy who can advise him on some European experiences, how you should approach uh, things here 
because I can see him. Uh, I believe that he's watching you the way you're grinding in your in your uh, days off, uh, the way you approach games, uh, the way you n- what you know about European basketball. And I, I believe you have a lot of conversations. I remember you were sitting in in the, in the gym in the stands watching our Gloria Cup games. I saw that all the guys were around you were talking a lot of stuff. So I I think that. Um, all these players, these talented players, they also need some good leadership examples around them. And uh, I think that, uh, I hope that John is embracing it. I, jo- I hope that John is, uh, let's say, he's valuing it and he will understand that uh, importance uh, later the years when he will be an even bigger uh, thing in Europe. Yeah, I think um, you hit it right on the head. Um, they use me kind of as a springboard. Um, they know my experience, you know, 12 years professionally, you know, I've played at the highest levels. And I took a, you know, very large contract and, you know, they want to be in that position. And so he's constantly asking me, you know, what teams look for in bigs, like what makes this guy special? Um, why does this guy make this amount of money? And I'm kind of breaking it down on the skill set or what this person do does or why they're valuable. And I think um, with Jonathan, you, you were perfect right on target with the files. Um, I always say um, he's elite at everything. Um, um shooting in the mid-range area, the shortcut, um, finishing around the basket, all the rebounds, defense rebounds. He can also switch one through five. He's long, he's athletic. He has an incredible motor, which is something that is not seen in a lot of big minutes because he can go hard for four straight quarters. I don't care if you have him hedging screens. I don't care if you have him going for the glass every off rebound. I don't care if you have him sitting 100 pick and rolls. He's going to do it 100 miles an hour, and you're going to think, does this guy ever get tired? Like He, he doesn't even want to come out of practice. When coach subs him, like, all right, get a break. I'm, I'm okay, coach. I'm not tired. Like <laughs> He's just a machine. That's what I always say. I say, young fella, relax. We need to keep you nice and fresh for the long run. You got, We got 10 months. We got nine-month grind. Like, But he, he's just a great player, and I think um, offensively, defensively, like he's elite in every category. The only thing I will say is he has to get better with the fouls. And I think that will come with his experience with, in Europe, with him learning how refs call things, when to use that physicality, what not. And sometimes I think he's punished because he's just so strong. And the referees kind of don't know how to gauge his strength. When he gets hit, you know, he doesn't move that much and he still finishes. So he thinks he can return that same physicality to another end. And, you know, you're, you're just a little bit stronger than a lot of guys. You can't really do that. <laughs> and I think, um, in the yearly, he might have less foul problems because, you know, those guys are a little bit stronger and they won't go flying as much um, as they do at the Euro Cup level because he's just something that they haven't seen. And uh, the other only category I think he needs to improve on is being able to pass out of the double. Um, but as far as scoring, rebounding, defense, I mean, these are elite levels. If he learns how to throw out the double, just coming from the NBA, he's used to all the spacing. Um the defensive three-second rule keeps you from being able to double guys consistently, um, makes it harder, you know, easier to make the passes just because the court is so spaced, the three-point line is farther. I think once he's adjusting to the lack of spacing in Europe, how the paint's congested, how someone's always there, how, you know, teams see that he's a focal point of the offense and they're going to try to stop that. After he gains experience and time, I think he will add that dimension to his game. And when he does, I mean, look out. I mean, I, I know all the big dogs that will come from him, all the Final Four teams. And, you know, he, he's that type of talent. Yeah, for, for me, he kind of reminds uh, Jalen Reynolds. I mean, he also has that motor. He's also very good in, in switch-all defense. Uh, I would say he's very hard guy, hard to defend a guy on the court, on the EuroLeague level. And I believe that John also will be very successful in, on the EuroLeague level soon. And I actually had uh, the question uh, for you because... Uh, there will be a lot of teams actually looking for a center uh, in a summer free agency, including Barcelona, Milan, Olympiacos, Zenit, Fenerbahce, Bayern, Maccabi. I mean, a lot of teams, a lot of potential landing spots uh, for, for Motley. But uh, I know that FS fans, uh, they're very... Um, they're always talking about the center they need to improve their chances uh, to win the EuroLeague, and they were they're looking for a potential backup uh, for for Brian Dunstan, uh, for example. And in a hypothetical scenario, if Motley is joining FS right now, I hope it won't happen because it will hurt your uh, EuroCup uh, title chances. And uh, I know that uh, 
transfer deadline for the Euroleague teams it was moved uh, from February 9th to 20th, uh, probably something like that. But anyway, in hypothetical scenario, do you think that Motley or at least that type of player could be that missing piece uh, for FS to improve their chances? Or they're even they don't need uh, the center like Motley because they have enough talent, enough pieces, enough uh, players on their front line with uh, not only Dunstan, not only Petrushev, uh, but also Tibor Plies improved uh, this year, for example. Uh, he would be a godsend for FS. Um, when he went there, they might expect him to come in as a backup, but he would be the starter. Um, <laughs> or he would be the main center with many of them off the bench. It would just be just for strategy, and he would play the majority of the minutes at center. Um, FS's problem is they lack a third consistent option. I know what I'm going to get every night from Misich. You know, he's aggressive. He's great in the pick and roll. He's having a great season. He's shooting the ball well. I know what I'm going to get from Larkin. He's not scoring at the same clip. That, he, that we've seen in previous years, but he's still efficient. He's playing for the team. He's giving you 13 points, five assists, 14 points, five assists. And you know in the clutch moments he's going to be there. But the question with us is, who's the third player? Is it Mormon? Is it Singleton? Is it Price? You just really never know. And it's hard to win at the yearly level with two players. And, I mean, you heard it um, with Jesse Kevin at Barcelona when they played Unix. He said, Higgins was great. He said, Brandon Davis was okay. But you cannot win in the Euro League with one and a half or two players. And, and that's their problem. Until they find that, they're going to continue to struggle and it could be tough to make the playoffs. And I think with Motley, there would be no question who the third option is. He might jump and become the first or second option on that team because he's that type of talent. And people maybe underestimate the Euro Cup or maybe underestimate a guy who came from the NBA who doesn't have that Euro League experience. But with his physical attributes, with his strength, with his touch, his feeling around the basket, and playing with two good pick and roll players where you have to double. This is why he kills so much for us because he's special, but I demand a double team off for every pick and roll, which means he's catching in a short row situation against the three or two on the weak side, and he's unstoppable. And that's, that would be the same exact scenario at FS, except now they have two players who demand a trap or a hard hedge off the pick and roll. And you know who was that third person last year? I think that it was uh, definitely Kronoslav Simon. He was uh, playing an amazing year, and especially when Shin Larkin was out in the beginning of the season last uh, year, he was just dominating uh, all over the EuroLeague uh, courts. And uh, I checked some stats, and I tried to um, see some uh, comparisons or similarities between the last year and this year. And actually, right now, uh, Simon is on a let's say, biggest decrease, biggest decline on an Anadolu FS roster. That last season, he was averaging 11 points on tremendous uh, 56% two-point shooting and 41% three-point shooting. Uh, and he was really that uh, another option on the court, another great ball handler with an amazing IQ and the way how he could set up uh, himself for a good shot, for an open look, or just uh, involve his uh, teammates. Teammates, And this year, he's not so efficient. He is averaging 7.2 points uh, on 47% two-point shooting and 29% three-point shooting. So maybe he's that uh, missing piece on, uh, on FS uh, roster this year uh, to make them more solid. Uh, some other players are also uh, declined a bit. For example, Chris Singleton from six points to uh, less than four points per game on a very bad shooting. Dunstan, he's also getting older. And I'm not blaming Simon at all because he's uh, 36. That's that's a lot, actually. And that's hard to uh, stay so good on the Euroleague league level. But maybe all these pieces, they're coming together. And that's why we see FS only in the eighth seed at the moment. Although I'm not so sure. I mean... I still believe that uh, they will make the Final Four uh, this year. I think that they still have enough talent. Uh, they are deep enough. And with some time, all these big teams, they improve uh, during the season. And when it really matters, I think that they will be there. And they will be a hell of a matchup for any playoff team. And I still uh, think that uh, talent-wise, uh, roster-wise, uh, chemistry-wise, they, they can be over there. And in the Final Four, one game, you never know what can happen. Yeah, what scares me with FS is that um, they're very experienced, but they think they can just hit the light switch. And I've seen this with teams who've won championships, who've had success. I mean, you're kind of seeing it with the Lakers this season in the NBA. You think because we've won a championship, we've had success, all we have to do is just kind of maintain, maintain, and then we're going to hit the switch. But sometimes the switch doesn't come on. Sometimes you put yourself in a bad matchup in the top eight. 
and you have no home court advantage and you're the A C and you gotta go play Barcelona in Barcelona, now it's a little bit more difficult to get to that final four. So I think that just from watching them play, um, they don't have that same sense of urgency. They're not as hungry. They're a year older. You could tell when that COVID season ended, they felt like they were cheated of a title. They felt like they didn't get the respect they deserved. They came in hungry, anxious, and eager to prove something. I just don't see that same fight, that same desire. And then with those guys underperforming this year, some guys playing below their level of what we're used to seeing, that just isn't a strong enough defensive team to withstand that. You know, they were special because they were elite offensively. They were scoring the ball. They were moving it. They were rotating. There were shooters everywhere. You couldn't really help on me, or Larkin just because you had Singleton shooting on the 40% from three. You had Boba shooting on the 40% from three. Simone shoots on the 40% from three. Tibor Price steps out. Hey, it's a pick and pop big. Like, all of these options offensively didn't allow their defensive problems to kind of affect their success. But now with the drop-off on the efficiency, with the drop-off of the third option, with the lower shooter percentages from guys hitting a little slump, they're not finding their rhythm. You just see that there's a lot more underlying issues with this FS team. And I think they'll make the playoffs. I do. But there's no way they're going to beat Barcelona in Barcelona in the series. There's no way. Not after after all the things that's happened without him getting kicked out, with him telling him I won the cup, um, <laughs> with um, – them beating them in the final last year, there's going to be an extreme motivation with Barcelona. And I just don't see that same desire with FS. Yeah, what's important for FS is to to climb uh, to climb up uh, on the standings, just avoid teams like Barcelona, probably just avoid Real Madrid because they're also, they're much better than they were last year. They're so deep, they're so talented. Now they're added Gabriel Deck, which is also unfair. Uh, talking about the EuroLeague uh, mid-season transfers. But uh, th- the situation with the third seed is so unclear because there are a lot of uh, teams with up, uh, ups and downs. For example, Olympiacos, they were looking solid, but now they're suffering after uh, post uh, with post-COVID effect. Milan, they're good, but they're also not very uh, consistent. CSKA, I mean, they're uh, still struggling. Zenit, Unix, you never know what can you expect. So uh, the fact is that FS, they have to cl- climb up at least up to sp- uh, two spots uh, to be the sixth seeded teams uh, team at least, and then we'll see. I mean, with all these teams, uh, their situation is pretty unclear, so that playoff uh, matchup would be very unpredictable. But one thing I wanted to add about FS is, despite all these um, players uh, decreasing, uh, declining, and and being below their uh, level of which we were used to, they're still producing the third best offensive rating in EuroLeague, which is uh, incredible, which is unbelievable. And uh, I just hope that in, in two months they will be better, but uh, I just wanted to ask you as a basketball player, is it if, if the team is struggling, if the team is not finding their rhythm in end of the January, is it the time when you start to be concerned about the general situation? Or it's still very I think, early? I think they have time. They have time. They can flip the switch. If really, if one or two people outside of Larkin and Misha step up and take the responsibility, this team will be in great shape. It just takes one or two players to step up and say, okay, I'm going to play better. I'm going to take some of the pressure off of them. You can't put all the pressure on two players, no matter how great they are, how special they are. Two players have to do it every night, and you're going to have to probably score, you know, low 80s. And even if Mises and Larkin both score 20, I mean, there's still 40-plus more points that need to be accounted for from someone outside of those two. So I think they have some time, but they have to hit a streak. Um, you want to be peaking at the right time, and if you don't build that confidence, if you don't get that rhythm going, it's going to be difficult. The star players will always be in a better rhythm because they have the ball more. Um, they're playing more, it's easy to get a rhythm. But the role guys, um, a lot of times you'll see the role guys need home games, you know, to get in that rhythm, to get that flow because they feed off the crowd, or you'll need them to have some success. Role guys struggle when the pressure's on. And that's why the big guys make the big money, the star players. And the role guys, when you've lost four, five, six games in a row, when, you know, management's putting pressure on you, when Ottoman might be giving you punishment practices, all these things are coming into play. It's just, you know, tightening the pressure around your neck. And you get to see who's made of what and who can handle the pressure. And everyone doesn't respond to pressure the same. So 
you know, I, I played at FS. I know some of the guys. Um, you know, I have a good relationship with the coaching staff there. You know, I'm rooting for them, but I just don't see the same team. But it's not too late because they did hit the switch last season and they surprised us all. So I wouldn't be surprised if they're able to do that again. But they must act quickly, as you said, because they, there's certain matchups in that playoff series that they do not want. And it's Barcelona and Madrid. Anybody else, I will feel comfortable with them in the series. But with those two teams, I don't see them coming out on top. By the way, uh, Coach Ataman, he was ejected for the third time uh, this year in, in the last game against uh, Barcelona. And some people think that it can be related to the current situation uh, of FS. I mean, them losing games, still uh, couldn't find, uh, cannot find the rhythm and things like that. Do you think it's it's related? Uh, because you know Ataman very well and people think that maybe he's losing control because of, of, of that, because of the poor results and maybe that he's not uh, waking up his uh, team. So Adamant is very strategic. Um, everything he does, there's a mental aspect, a motivational factor, um, something to kind of push your button to set that alarm in you. Um, from my years playing with him, sometimes he would issue personal challenges um, to you privately, um, to you in front of the team. Um, he, his favorite is through the media. Um, if he wants you to wake up, he wants you to play well. He'll single a player out. He'll say, This player is not playing at his level. This is why we lost. I mean, you've seen him do it with Misic when they played on the road game. He said he's not playing at the yearly level of an MVP player. This is why we lost. And a lot of people might take that the wrong way, but a player with the strong mental and capacity to, to fight through adversity is going to take that as I want to show something. I want to prove something. I remember when we were playing in the Euro Cup um, final and I had um, like a, a tore calf muscle. Um, like a grade one or grade two, and I was recovering. I still wasn't myself, but I was trying to fight through. First game, I didn't play well, but it was expected because I was hurt. I didn't practice for two weeks, and I was just trying to get my rhythm. And he goes to the media, and he says, our MVP did not play like an MVP. <laughs> and, you know, for me, it didn't bother me because I knew who he was. I knew he believed in me. You signed me. But I told myself, okay, in the next game, closing game, I will show you what MVP looks like. And I think that game I finished with like 13 or 14 points in the fourth quarter and we ended up winning the Euro Cup. These are things that he does. Um, he's for sure getting thrown out because he's frustrated with the team's um, lack of aggression, um, with the inability to close games um, and with the stress that they're causing because he's used to winning. He likes to win. He likes to make bold predictions and claims and he wants to fight for his club. But if he feels like you're not fighting, he's going to fight for you. And I think these are just simple messages that he's getting to the team really to show them that I'm here. I'm still coaching you. I still care. Where's your energy at? Where's your fight? And they have yet to respond, but I wouldn't be surprised if you see some media um, call outs or, you know, some more practices or some things, um, some hotel nights where straight after the game, you're going to the hotel. Like he, he's very creative and <laughs> trying to find ways outside of the yearly PA. <laughs> I, I remember one of his favorite punishments, especially in Galatasaray. I just don't remember if you were on, on his team already, but I remember when the team was losing, he was keeping all of his players in the hotel, even in Istanbul, until his team won the game. So he's, yeah, he's yeah. very famous for his punishments. Which, which one? I remember that. I, I, I experienced that the year we won the championship. <laughs> he did that to us. <laughs> how, how long did you stay in the hotel? So we luckily we had a, a Euro Cup game on that Wednesday and then we had a game on Saturday and he was upset that we lost the game. So we stayed in a hotel for an extra three days and we had practice the first day um, uh, that night after the game, after we lost. So we were talking about a midnight practice, uh, 11 o'clock practice, whatever. And then we went to the hotel, immediately watched film. And then um, to sleep we went, it probably was, I would say 1.30 when we went to sleep. We woke up, practiced at 7.30, um, went back to the hotel, had lunch, and then had practice again at 2 o'clock. Okay. And then we were supposed to have a practice that evening, but guys were getting so upset, and we ended up getting the point, so he let it He let it go. He said, okay, no evening practice, but y'all still in the hotel. And then uh, I think we came out, and we, we were so mad, and we didn't want to live that life. We, we killed the team 
Um, but it wasn't because of his punishment practices. And this is what I told him. It wasn't because of that. Because a lot of times in Europe, they think if they punish you, uh, if we find the team, they will go win. And then if you win or you play well, they think, yes, our fine work, our punishment work. Like, no, sometimes in the game of basketball, you have ups and downs, ebbs and flows. Um, even the greatest players in the world struggle. It happens. But in Europe, it's perceived as if the punishment worked. And we won. And I guess in everybody's mind, it worked. <laughs> That's that's what uh, that's who Ergin Ataman is. And last year, uh, now they are uh, 10 and 10 in uh, in the Euroleague standings. And last year, I checked that after 20 games, they were 11 and 9, and uh, they were actually 11 and 10 after round 21. Uh, but then they went for a eight game winning streak. So we'll see. Maybe that uh, game against Panathinaikos, uh, very hard uh, victory after Mormon's three pointer. Maybe that will work out as a good uh, wake up uh, call for for that team because even the last year. Uh, after one of the disappointing uh, games, they had a very long uh, uh, players-only meeting where they discussed some things until the four, th four in the morning, uh, something like that. And that kind of conversation really uh, turned things over. We will see if, if they can s um, play a switch button again. And there's one uh, team which managed to play that uh, switch button uh, it's monaco and they're they're on a very good uh, run right now they were uh, they won four games in a row including games against, uh, games against zenit and bayern munich very solid and very strong teams they won five of seven yearly games and their new coach uh, sasha uh, bradovic and their numbers were just terrific since around 15 they produced best offensive rating in the euroleague uh, they they were first in three point accuracy, hitting almost forty seven percent threes before they were making only thirty five uh, percent of uh, three pointers. They were first in true shooting percentage. They were fourth in assists, while uh, in in be between rounds first and fifteen they were only uh, seventeen. And I think that a lot of uh, has to do with uh, Sasha Bradovic because this is the coach who is known for his. Um, discipline he he's a good strategist and he has clear set of rules and that's what he did with monaco he quickly implemented some some rules just avoid um, iso situations low percentage situations he wanted to put his players in the very clear uh, roles just to show their uh, best uh, abilities he also emphasized defense although defense defensive rating even decreased uh, from 12 to 15 position in the euroleague uh, but it seemed like uh, the whole discipline, the whole um, role setting worked out for this team very well because we have uh, we see a lot of players stepping up, uh, including uh, Donatas Motunas uh, producing incredible numbers. He was averaging only eight points uh, with coach Mitrovic. Now he's averaging more than 14. Dwayne Bacon, he, he's also improved. But what I like the most is Mike James. And I think that he... he now he's sharing more point guard duties and I was surprised the way he's controlling the team because it all starts from him and his numbers are also uh, incredible. Uh, he, he, he was 15 point per game player under coach Mitrovic on uh, with 45% uh, uh, of uh, two-point shooting and only 26% of uh, three-point shooting, uh, less than five assists. Now he's averaging almost 19 points on incredible efficiency, 59 two-point uh, two percent uh, sh shooting and 43% uh, three-point shooting, almost nine assists per game. And that's even taking almost less shots per game. But the way he's controlling his team, the way this team is sharing the ball, uh, the way this team started to play more, uh, more let's say, complete, more balanced basketball, using Mote Yunas in the post, also using Will Thomas and, and his uh, uh, basketball IQ, that's that's a different team uh, right now, and I love to, to see the way they play. Yeah, I think Monaco has shown something. Um, you know, since they hired the coach on December 13th, uh, Brogdon has them at 5-2. Um, they're playing with more energy. Um, you can tell oftentimes when there's a coaching change, there's a, a sense of um, alertness in the team because the first time a team is struggling or not meeting expectations, usually a coach is probably first to go. After the coach goes, if that doesn't work, now it's players. And I think players are aware of that. So you have to tighten up your game. You have to step up. But just they're utilizing their mismatches more, they're taking advantage of um, opportunities, um, I think the biggest difference I've seen is in the play of Mike James, as you said. Um, just looking at the percentages, 
from 43% from three to 26% from three. That's the difference with a Brownfish there. Um, when you see that in a player, um, things are going to open up more for Mike because he's so explosive. Um, he's great at getting to the basket. And early in the season, he was kind of struggling with a shot. He was still finding ways to affect the game, um, to make an impact. But he just wasn't the typical Mike James that we're used to seeing, who's arguably the most talented player in Europe. And I think with the Brownfish, uh, I think they have a, a respect, a mutual understanding. I can tell with how he plays. He enjoys playing for him. He likes it. He's passing more. He's creating more. He's taking that responsibility. And Abramovich being a great guard himself when he played, I think that respect level is, is strengthened and allowed Mike's play to increase. Another thing I noticed is over the 14 games before the coaching change, Mike only had two games with a PIR, PRI over, a PIR over 20. And already through seven games, he has five games with a PIR over 20. So that just tells you not only is his scoring and his percentages up, but he's affecting the games in other ways because it shows performance index rating. It's showing every aspect that he has his game on. And basically, his play has almost doubled if you look at that, um, just that statistic. Um, another thing that I like Monaco, I like how they play, I like improvement. Dwayne Bacon shot a tensor up from nine um, with the old coach to now up to 13. Um, and he's fully utilizing that and taking advantage. And he's showing why he was able to be a double figure scorer in the NBA. Now, what gives me pause and what makes me hesitate on this upbeat start is the schedule. Um, they ran into a very favorable schedule. Um, you look at the win against Zagiris. You know, I know we got a lot of Lithuanian fans here, but they're last in the league. Um, then they beat Alva Berlin. They're 16th place out of 18. Then you go to Maccabi. Their 13th place. They were coming into that game with seven straight losses, and Monaco beats them. Then I have a respectable win um, at Bayern Munich, a solid team, even though they're only 11th place. Solid, well coached, okay. And an impressive win at Zenit, double figure win, controlled the game. Um, so I'm wondering, Monaco, they're making leaps, they're improving, but they happen to hit a schedule patch that. You know, for any team in a year league, this is what you want. A team that's struggling, a team that's losing, and another team that's on a seven-game losing streak. I mean, this is like the best way to kind of get out of a rut and to, to create some momentum. So I'd like to see them against other playoff caliber teams, even teams in the mix, and I'll be able to assess further. But I do like what I see. I see improvement, and I do think they have a chance to maybe leapfrog and get to that eighth spot somehow because they're in the mix but they just have to continue to play at that level. I also wonder what will happen when Leo Westerman and Dante Hall uh, will be back in the rotation because sometimes when you're um, hand sh shorted by some uh, injuries, COVID problems, uh, for example, and when you have a short rotation, sometimes it even helps your team because all the players, they know that they're getting uh, solid minutes. The, they know that they're, they're getting uh, trust, uh, whatever happens. And they kind of focused more on the game. And coach is not, uh, he's also not hesitating, should I play this guy or that guy? And it seemed like for this team, even in the beginning of the season, I, I mentioned that this team just have too many players and they have to play all of them. And sometimes uh, they are missing chemistry because in French league, they use uh, different lineups, different players. In the Euro league, they're uh, sharing all these minutes. It's so hard to find the chemistry for this new team. And uh, now it seemed like that all the pieces were set uh, on a very good uh, track and Leo Westerman and Dota Hall they're important players and Mike James he was playing more as a point guard uh, since the coaching change how this will change when Leo Westerman the true floor general will come back Dota Hall is an uh, incredible rim protector probably the most athletic uh, center in the EuroLeague um, next to Josh Nebo uh, but Donatos Matunas is performing very well so how they will adjust how they will share all these minutes it's going to be another interesting adjustment for, for coach Obradovic, but at least you mentioned, yeah, you mentioned the kind of uh, favorable schedule, but that was the best schedule for a new coach, you know, to, to come to the team, to boost the confidence with getting some wins, implementing his rules, and maybe they will prepare better for, for the big games that are uh, coming up uh, for them. Yeah, I agree. If Mike keeps playing at this level, and he's more than capable. We've seen him on the MVP takes with Cheska you know, before they had their issues there and they parted ways. But if he continues to play at this level, leads the way, um, it's going to inspire confidence in his teammates. And you know he's a great closer. I think the question is not that. Mike's 
to Eunice has been excellent. They got to continue to feature him in the post. I don't think there's really any big who can guard him on the inside with all the moves, the footwork, the skills, the passing. Uh, I mean, they essentially have two guys that you have to double, him on the inside, Mike on the outside. And all other guys have to do is just be, be ready to hit shots. And if you can hit a spot up, spot up open shot, be solid on defense, you're going to hold a high value playing for this Monaco team. And, you know, they are a team that also um, has to find a third score. Um, you know, I know who the first two are. I wouldn't really consider Dante Hall a score. He's a great player. He's explosive. He's above the rim. He's finishing things. But I think Bacon's that third score. And I think with Abramovich, he's showing it. And that's why you're seeing him have more success because you need three scores. Um to be a playoff team, you know, in my opinion, I think that's what I see from the top eight. They have those three guys that they can depend on and they have a lot more consistency around that. Yeah. Mitrovic experience with this group ended up uh, badly. Um, he lost the control of the locker room. He lost the trust of the locker room. He even got in a kind of a fight in the locker room. So that, that coaching change was kind of inevitable, inevitable, but I, I wanted to ask you, uh, what do you think? When when is the start? I mean, all these reasons why Coach Mitrovic was replaced. Uh, I mean, it was a top of the iceberg. But what is the start? Uh, let's see. What are the roots of a coaching change uh, from a player's perspective? When do you think uh, things start going badly, and sometimes the coaching change is just unavoidable? Uh, let's see. What kind of mistakes coaches sometimes do, losing the control of the locker room and uh, of their team? I think number one as a coach, when you come in, you got to have a rapport, a relationship with your best player. I'm not saying you need to uh, baby him. I'm not saying that you need to give him preferential treatment, but you need to have a relationship there because your best player kind of sets the tone and they can relay your message to your team. And if you have a good relationship with your best player, you can be hard on him. You can be direct to him. You can talk to him and he won't take it personal. And everybody else gets in line. If I'm the 12th man on the bench, and I see um, the highest paid player is getting yelled at, getting berated about on his mistakes in film, um, getting pushed mentally, I start to see, okay, if they're talking to him like that, I know if I make mistakes, for sure they're going to talk to me like that. And that's kind of what a lot of coaches don't do. Um, they don't you know, develop that relationship with the best player, and they don't um, allow him to be coached. You know, I've seen it on certain teams where – You know, when I was in Kimki, the best player doesn't get coached the same as anybody else. And then that creates animosity between the team. Um, it creates uh, risk, um, jealousy, hate, whatever the case may be. It just makes anything that a coach says go in one end, not the other, because you didn't say it to this player. That's why I like um, Barcelona coach, just because he treats everyone the same, whether you're the highest paid, the lowest paid, whether you're 40 or whether you're 18. He's treating you all the same, and there's a respect in that. And he might yank you out on a mistake. He might pull you up, but there's respect because everybody gets the same level. And I think once you establish that as a coach, um, everybody's on the same page. They might not like it, but you're treating everyone the same, and there's something about fairness and honesty that, you know, we can respect. And then the next thing, coaches have to treat players like adults. We're not children. We're not your kids. A lot of us have family of our own. Uh, we're, a lot of us are over 30 years old. You know, you can coach me, you know, but respect me. You can yell at me, you know what I'm saying, but respect me. There's a difference between talking to me and talking at me. And I think um, a lot of that gets thrown out the window because of a power dynamic. You would never see this um, in the U.S., in the NBA. You would never see a coach talking to LeBron James like this or a coach talking to um, Kevin Durant like this. But in Europe, you'll see coaches sometimes throwing things, almost hitting players, uh, you know, sometimes being downright disrespectful. And I think if coaches can eliminate those two things and, and you can still have the power, there's still a dynamic that you're um, above me as far as what we do with this team, decisions we make. But just have a respect with, you, with your players and, and they'll fight for you. They'll run through a wall for you. Yeah, it seems like uh, that's what's happening now in Monaco. And uh, Sasha Bradovich is also a very disciplined coach. Uh, he's a hard coach. But uh, I talked with some people, and uh, even people who know him pretty well said that he kind of changed a bit. Uh, he's more flexible right now. Uh, he's more patient uh, right now. Probably it uh, takes a lot with dealing with uh, his players. Uh, he's also more. He's a better uh, 
with self control of himself. So um, a lot of expected that uh, if Mitrovic and Mike James or other players' connection didn't work out, a lot of thought that with Obradovic things might uh, get even worse. But now, as you mentioned, uh, all the players are following their leader, and so far it's working. And uh, good job for Coach Obradovic and and Monaco. Uh, let's let's see if they will continue that playoff uh, push. Although it will be very hard because uh, uh, okay, they are tied in wins, the eight seeded Anadolu FS, but uh, they have to surpass surpass them in the standings or to catch any of these teams with twelve victories, for example, Olympiakos, Unix, Zenit, CSKA. So. It will be unbelievably hard task. But talking about coaches, um, what kind of coach uh, is Velimir Perasovic? Because I remember uh, when he joined Unix Kazan, uh, a lot of people also thought that it's kind of all programmed that at some point of the season he will get into in a conflict with either Mario Hazonia, yeah, I don't know, Lorenzo Brown, Isaiah Cannon, uh, OG Mayo, any of big personalities that uh, uh, Unix uh, have. And especially after the beginning of the season, they were uh, one and four team. They lost uh, against Fenerbahce by 39 points. Everybody thought that he's probably the second coach after Dusko Ivanovic, who might uh, be fired uh, pretty soon but he managed to turn things so quickly, although he was always very disciplined from the day one of the Unix preseason cam. I heard that, you know, all these teams had to run a lot. Uh, all these practices were really tough and not all the players liked it, but now it seemed like all the players are on the same page, on the same line, and this team has a amazing chemistry on the court, which seemed like very hard to achieve before the season with all these great players, great individuals, but all these players who need the ball. And there was even a joke that they probably need two or three balls on the court, you know, to make everybody happy. But <laughs> no, they are the best uh, EuroLeague team at the moment. I think um, Pesovic, he's, he's a tough coach. Like, um, his preseasons are extremely difficult. Um, like you said, high in conditioning, um, constant practices, um, constant pushing, long days, lots of film. Um, he really challenges you mentally and physically. And I think, you know, you've seen that a lot of guys didn't really like it. I think they were a little bit beat up coming into the season, which is why you see the one and four start. Just the preseason was really draining to them. But from talking to some of the guys, um, from my experience to what they're experiencing, it seems like he's changed a little bit. It seems like he's a little bit more open-minded to um, have a little bit of player input. It seems like he's establishing relationships. You know, when I played with them, it wasn't really – any relationships with any of the players, you know, you just kind of came to work and, you know, you can play for someone for a year and you feel like you don't even really know them. Like, you know, him as a coach, you know, his demeanor, his temperament, but you don't know anything about him outside of that. You don't know his temperament or how he is as a person, any of those things. And I think sometimes, um, you know, that makes it tough, you know, for, you know, a trust to be built when you don't really know a person. I think, you know, he was a little bit cognizant of that. I think when he came to Unix, you know, he, you know, developed a relationship with the players. I think he's a little bit less demonstrative on the sideline. You know, he's still passionate, you know, still fighting, but, you know, I think he's, he's matured. I think sometimes getting fired can do that to you. Uh, when you get fired or, you know, you're at home, you have time to think, you have time to collect your thoughts. Um, you evaluate yourself, you see what you did well, what you could improve upon. And I mean, he's done an excellent job with Unix. Um, I keep, I keep wondering when it's going to end. Like, you're relying on four players to play the majority of the minutes. Um, I just don't know if that's sustainable in a modern year league with all these games, double weeks. Then you're playing in a tough domestic competition with the BTB league. And every game, even in BTB league, Herzogna is playing 33, 34 minutes. Uh, Ken is playing 25 minutes. Uh, Lorenzo Brown is playing 32, 33 minutes. John Brown is playing 32, 33 minutes. And, it's basically built around those four players. Um, and somehow they sustain it. I think the, the most important player is Lorenzo Brown just because he kind of initiates everything. He keeps everything flowing. And um, early in the preseason, I've seen maybe a slight disconnect between the coach and him just from the lack of trust, um, early substitutions. You know, we're playing in, t in tournaments throughout the season and, you know, he's making mistakes. You can see the, the look on players' faces. They just weren't on, on the same beat. And now I'm watching the games, and even when Brown makes a mistake, he's keeping them in the game. He's allowing them to play. They're playing free. 
You know, you know, players feeling good when they try fancy passes, no look behind the backs, when they're throwing lobs and the guys reverse dunking it, like they're taking risks on the court. And that's because they have the trust of the coach. And, you know, you just see that that dynamic. And I think he did a great job of putting everyone in their role. Like, Cannon, we're going to have you come in. You're going to be our shooter. We're going to use you like a Kyle Courage. You're going to come off down screen, pin down, you're going to catch and shoot. That's your job. Lorenzo, you're going to create all their action. Azonia, you're going to attack and transition. You're going to be a beast in transition. Once you get your rhythm, we're going to give you also pick and rolls. We're going to let you play. You're our guy. You're our main scorer. But we don't need you to score 20. If you can get us 14 to 15 points, we'll be successful. John Brown, we need you to do what you do on defense. Sometimes you can break away from our defensive schemes and our principles because you have that instinct. You have that ability. We need you to protect everyone. Everyone who gets beat off the dribble, everyone to pick and roll, we need you to do that. And he's gotten everyone to buy in, but he's put them in a perfect role that they're great at. A lot of times coaches put people in positions that they're not good at. Um, they, they sign the player. They like the player. They watch from the player. And then they put him in a whole system that the player has no experience in playing and or has never been good at. What, what Paris Bitch did is he put them in a system that they're comfortable with, that they've been doing their whole life, and then told them to go play. And this is why Brown didn't have the success at center that they expected because they didn't let him play. Like, now he's playing. He's free. He's, he's making mistakes. He's getting the pick and roll. He's getting touches. And, and now you're seeing how special he is as a point guard. Yeah, and now what's funny about Unix that we're talking about all these very talented players uh, who are also pretty offensively oriented players. I mean, individually, they're just amazing individuals on the court who can decide games and do amazing things to put up uh, crazy numbers. But at the same time, uh, this year, I didn't see any other team which felt that kind of joy in just playing defense, in winning some, in making some defensive stops. I mean, the way they're passionate about uh, stopping other teams, uh, putting them um, in low numbers, they put a lot of teams, like uh, a lot of very offensive-oriented uh, teams like Barcelona, Real Madrid, and all uh, by less than uh, 70 points. And, of course, it all starts with uh, John Brown uh, making this team so flexible in terms of uh, defense uh, to have such a um, great big man uh, who can defend all the all five positions, who can also play as a center. It's just a big, big uh, thing for, for any other coach, but this team's built so nicely com built so completely that it's it's just amazing to watch them and but as you mentioned uh, the dev uh, the minutes uh, they're playing on that's that's the main question if they will manage to contain to keep uh, playing on that level and I have I had a question before this uh, podcast if we will move Final Four from May 27-29 to February 27-29 or March 27-29, taking in, in consideration that Zenit will have, would have Shabazz Napier healthy and finally playing, and Ceska maybe they would have some time to build their chemistry to improve uh, the quality of their game. Do you think Unix would have the best shot at winning the EuroLeague title, or you would uh, go with another Russian club, either Zenit or, or Ceska? See, it's tricky because Unix is playing the best right now. They are. And I like the roster because it's guys who are hungry. Um, we talked about Ethics earlier. These are guys who haven't really established themselves at that level. Lorenzo Brown was coming off a year where he wasn't at his normal level, and he was eager to show it. Cannon wanted to show that he can make that jump, that he can be a high-level player at the year league. John Brown coming out of nowhere, trying to make a name for himself, and he's doing that. Herzogna trying to show that he can be a leader of the playoff team. Um, he can be a main factor. And I think um, that's why I like Unix. But what gives me pause um, is that the season Zenit's had without a point guard. I mean, <laughs> they've literally been one of the top five or six teams all season, and they have no point guard. They're playing a two at point guard, a three, sometimes Tonika, sometimes Kooligan. Like, sometimes they slide Lloyd over. They have no point guard. So when you're telling me they're getting a quality player like Shabazz Napier, a guy who can play the pick and roll, who can shoot the three, play in the isolation, play in the mid-range, get easy assists to Poitras, um, to Gutierrez. Like, he's going to make the game so easy for everyone, and everyone's going to be able to slide back into their normal roles and do what they normally do. And um, Javi Pascal is a great coach. You know, he has excellent sets. He, he gets guys to come in and fit his system, and maybe they're – Sometimes it might be the best player in, in that position, one of the best in Europe. Sometimes it might be a guy and you're like, uh, 
is he really going to fit? Is he good enough for this level? And then he puts him in there, he plugs him into a system, and, and they play fine. And I think um, if I had to pick a team, I'm going with Zenit just because um, the versatility with, to go big and switch. You put Jordan Mickey at the four. You have Portis at the five. They can switch one through five. They're big, they're strong. They can control the paint. Um, you have a Jordan Lloyd who can really score the ball, who's there for you in the clutch moments. You have a Polnika at the three who just is a jack of all trades. He's going to guard everybody. If you need him to create, he'll do that. He's going to get you eight to nine points, uh, five to six rebounds, four assists, three steals, like, whatever. Like, he's going to do those type of things. He's kind of the guard version of a John Brown that's not as dominant defensively, but just a guy who does a little bit of everything that you need. And then Shabazz Napier, I think you are probably isn't aware of how good he is. Like, he's that good. And I think um, he's going to take him over the top. I don't, I don't even consider Cheska right now in the form that they're in to even be at the same level of a Zenit or Unix. It's just not there right now. I think they have identity issues, um, lack of point guard play. Um, you don't know what you're going to get. They lack a pure uh, PG that can play the pick and roll. Um, and I think um, they're really starting to see just how good Mike James was. And I think they're missing that, that dynamic. Not only someone who can create and make easy shots for someone, but someone who can take over in the clutch moments that – you know, it's Ben Kleiber, and he can do that. But what makes teams good is usually you have two or three guys who can do that. And right now, I just don't see that with them. Um, and and it's why they're the third best team in Russia, not only in the VTB, but um, in the EuroLeague as well. Yeah, I, I like your point about Zenit. It seems like people even for, forgot that uh, they are missing, let's say, Kevin Pangos type of uh, player uh, on top of uh, their current results. Uh, they were covering that point guard uh, gap so so nicely, and you can see it on stats uh, as well because uh, Xavi Pascal and, and Zenit and all the Chavez teams they were pretty good defensive uh, teams, especially last year. We can remember how they managed to stop Barcelona in the playoffs, and they were so close of making the final four. Uh, this year, uh, they have the sixth best defensive rating. Uh, but offensively, they're only 12th best uh, on the EuroLeague. And it tells a lot uh, how they were missing uh, the point guard, which, as you said, uh, who, as you said, uh, could make the game easier for everybody around. And uh, we are not so sure about Shabazz Napier in Europe because we didn't see him uh, playing uh, for long stretches, let's say, here. But we all saw what he did against Unix uh, in the preseason, scoring 33 points. He was destroying all teams generally. So you just you can imagine what kind of player is joining uh, Zenit in the upcoming weeks, and if they manage to make the top six with the current in the current situation under current circumstances. That's that's that makes a lot of room for improvement uh, for the second part of the season. Although answering the question before the season, I I, I had uh, Ska as my Euroleague winners. I thought that uh, with healthy Milutinov and with an upgrade in the point guard position, they will be very very good team. I I have to go with Ska again, but <laughs> I'm really concerned about this team because as, as you mentioned, I'm also lacking of a. True leader on their backcourt. Uh, okay, Will Clyburn can be your perimeter leader on the court, but he needs uh, um, another guy uh, next to him to be consistent, uh, to be on a highest level. They have Alexis Schwed, who is great scorer. They have Daniel Hackett, who is still an amazing player, super, super good defensive player. They have Ifa Lundberg, but they are not that level yet. I don't see them as the players who can win the title uh, for you. And I thought that uh, Sky will find uh, that missing piece uh, way quicker uh, when it's happening right now. It's the end of January and we still don't know if they will sign another point guard. Who would they sign? We can see that the market in Europe is really bad. Teams like Fenerbahce, they cannot uh, buy any solid uh, point guard. They were rejected by three teams uh, refusing to let their, uh, let's say, star scorers to join them or asking um, way too much uh, for the buyout. So it's tough. And uh, Sky is in a difficult position. I'm, I'm, I'm missing the chemistry on the court as well. Uh, what's interesting that Itudis won the EuroLeague twice with Ceska with Kyle Hines as a center. And usually he was playing very dynamic uh, lineups uh, with all players able to switch and with, with very... Uh, let's say, balance uh, lineups. And these lineups were oriented on backcourt stars. 
Now it's different. They have Shengelia, Milutinov, and the these kind of players who are kind of forced to build your game in a very different way. And I, I just don't see that uh, clicking. But who knows? I mean, it's, it's the end of January, uh, a lot of time to make some roster improvements, to find that chemistry. And if they manage to f- make the final four, as I said, one game can can go either ways. Yeah, I just, I don't see any additions being added. I mean, you look this late in the season um, on the market, most guys who are in the G League are going to stay because there's opportunities to go to the NBA right now, especially with COVID and um, with the way that teams are signing guys, the amount of guys that the lead has signed the season has already broke a record and we haven't even reached the halfway point, I guess. I think also that a lot of teams aren't going to let guys go this late because they don't know the destiny of the season yet. You know, a lot of times teams let um, maybe a main player go because they've already reached their goals or they're too far from their goals, or they have a financial crisis. Either way, a player who's available at this point in time, if they're just happen to be free, they're probably not good enough to play at this level. And, you know, I love Will Clyburn. I think he's, you know, can be the guy for them, and he is that guy. But the thing is, he's a great scorer. What Cheska needs also is someone who makes the game easier for other people, someone who gets easy shots. Uh, they had that with Mike James last year, demanding double teams, coming off the pick and roll, you know, getting seven assists a game, also scoring at 20 points. Right now, Cheska doesn't have someone to make the game easier for others. They have a great uh, low post score in Shigeria, but is he a necessary creator? No. They have a great one-on-one and low post score in Will Clyburn. Is he a creator? No. They have uh, the best offensive rebounder in Europe, Molotinov, a great in seals, solid in the pick and cut, not a creator. Like They just don't have that and with the instability at the point guard position, sometimes they try Effie Lombard, sometimes they try Alexi Chavez, sometimes. Um, now that Grigona's season's been up and down, he hasn't played at that same level that we've seen at Zagiris. The guard play has probably been their weak link, is what I would say. Um, and until that's solved, um, you're not going to have success. I believe that guard play is number one. I would rather have strong guard play and no big play than have strong big play and no guard play because guards have the ball the entire day. They make every decision. They control everything. You can get by with a big man who can just catch and finish. You can't get by with a guard who can't make decisions in the clutch, who can't make big shots, and who can't consistently create easy opportunities in offense. Because as you get closer to the playoffs, um, those offensive sets don't work. They're scouted. Um, Teams have seen film on you all season. Now you need creativity. You need guys who are just good. I can just create a one-on-one mismatch. I can just get by my guy. I can just find the right play. And when a coach has that, they can be truly special. And I just don't think Cheska has that this season. And if those guys are capable, they're not in form, they're not in rhythm, and they're not um, having the confidence to continuously make those plays or to take those risks and break the offense. Because if you break it to this offense and you don't score or you don't find the right play, there's issues. And you got to be extremely confident to do that. Before, before going to the end, uh... I, I wanted to ask you about any topic you would like to express your voice. So what would be that topic? Uh, for me, I'd say um, one thing that was interesting is I noticed that the Final Four has changed, um, you know, from um, Germany, where it was supposed to be, to now to, to Belgrade. You know, I think um, I understand, uh, you know, probably less restrictions in Serbia. Um, excellent fan support. Um, you got the Red Star Partisan fans is excellent fan support. But the twist is, is that this season, you know, the year league decided to move the Euro Cup championship game um, to be included in part of the final four for the Euro League. But and is it official already? I mean, are the teams aware if it's actually happening? Because I also tried to talk with some Euro League people and I didn't uh, get a let's say final answer if they will make this happen al- already this year or from the next season. Uh, well, I hope I hope they don't. I think um, if you make a plan, you have something set. You should keep it that way. Um, and it just it's tough just because you know obviously with winning success with Monaco and the Verge, you know for us Euro Cup teams, it's looking like there's going to be one bid uh, to the Euro League, and that's everyone's goal to get their club and organization to the Euro League. So if you move it uh, to Belgrade and most likely there will be probably <laughs> partisan in the final four. You know, they're playing well. They're going to have home court all the way through it. Just, it seems a bit um, 
ironic. And maybe it's a coincidence, whatever the case may be, I understand, like, but it's not fair, I think, to the other teams because it's essentially a home game, you know, for a team that has probably the strongest fan base um, in Europe. So yeah. I don't know, like, I think um, I understand, like, what they're doing just because it's a good, it's a great city, you know, great fan support. Um, it's going to be great for the basketball product. You're going to have, if you turn on the TV, you have your lead pass, gym's going to be full. I mean, it's going to be electric. Um, it's going to be one of the best atmosphere, especially if, let's say, Partizan is able to make it to the Final Four. And all those fans, Serbian fans just love basketball. They'll stick around and watch, you know, all the EuroLeague games as well. And then I know you have Jaco, great coach. You know, they already want, you know, Partizan to be part of that EuroLeague because of the tradition, the history, the talent. But um, for me, I just feel like um, either the Euro Cup should be, you know, included uh out, not included in the Euro League as far as the final four thing. It should be either whoever's top team, like first place team, should get home court because you deserved it. If you were first place all regular season, um, whether that was Hoban 2, whoever, Bologna, Locomotive, they deserve home court. Um, but if you weren't, I just feel like it's a, it's a huge advantage to play on your home court, not have to travel, um, not have to go anywhere, have your normal routine, and then play in front of your own crowd. And, you know, that type of environment. That's why people fight for home court because home court is crucial. Yeah, I, I agree with your point, even though the Euro Cup final in Belgrade would be uh, amazing because I've been in the Euro League final four when it was hosted by Belgrade in 2018 and all all city was like uh, living basketball uh, all weekend long. It was amazing experience because on every corner you had a basketball conversation. The gym was full and it was really, really, really nice experience. But at the same time, uh, in the best scenario and ideal world, uh, I think that it should be the final Euro Cup final should be hosted either in a neutral arena, or as you mentioned, let's just award the highest seeded team or the team with the best win and lose record in the regular season. At the same time, just to motivate them or just to make all games important, even. Uh, for all these teams who have first seed, for example, locked for the playoffs, but maybe they're competing against the other team of a different group just to have a bigger number of wins to have that uh, home core advantage. That would be an ideal scenario. And that would be not just an ideal, but it would be fair scenario. And I've actually heard that if uh, Euro Cup final won't be played in Belgrade, as it was already discussed that the, it, w- it will change the third place game in the Euro League with the Euro Cup final. I heard that it might be that kind of alternative, just award the highest seeded team uh, from the regular season with the home court advantage, and that's how it should be. So probably we we should need uh, wait some time because um, Euro League is still dealing with uh, Belgrade for the final uh, for hosting the final four. It's it's not done yet it's leaning mm-hmm. towards uh, to this final decision uh, but probably then in the upcoming weeks uh, we will know what's uh, what will happen with the euro cup uh, final so maybe it will work out in that kind of fair way which we are talking about right now yeah and historically it's been that's how it's been you know the home team should be the team who's been the most dominant in the regular season that's how it, it kind of rewards the regular season and that's what makes europe special is because every game counts you know, every regular season game has had that playoff-like atmosphere, and that's what makes European basketball um, elite and special to me. And I think, um, you know, if we continue that model, um, you'll get also a great product, um, wherever the game may be, and you'll also get a good turnout. And I think you'll get, I guess, the best possible outcome. You know, if a team's good enough to be in the year elite and they don't have home court, then go win on somebody's court. And uh, you see Monaco did it uh, last year in the Euro Cup, so... That's my take on it. Yeah, and for example, even if it will be hosted by Belgrade, I just hope that they will make some reservations for guest team fans, uh, for example, and just to make reservation for 5,000 pa- fans uh, of the guest team, you know, just to make that uh, atmosphere more balanced, uh, not just mm-hmm. related to the home team. Although it's it's very early. We, we don't even know if Partizan will make the final. So let's let's just wait a little bit and let's just be patient. And... At the very, very end, I have these three very quick uh, questions uh, for you uh, without any deeper uh, analysis. Uh, the EuroLeague team that you always try to watch playing whenever you're free to choose on game days and why? For me, um, it's Milan. Um, I like Messina's system. 
Um, I like the creativity that they play with. Um, it's like a structured system, but he gives them the freedom to to use the talent, to use the gift. Uh, they have strong guard play. I always enjoy watching uh, Sergio Rodriguez play. Um, he's just a wizard with the ball. He finds everything. Malcolm Delaney is a solid player, you know, good in the pick and roll, makes decisions. They're just a fun team to watch, especially with Shields is healthy. Um, Devin Hall's a very good player who surprised me. You know, I didn't really know him that well until this season. But, you know, for me, the way that they've been able to sustain injuries, um, COVID, uh, they're just a fun team to watch. I like the tempo they play with, and I think they're a team that will make the Final Four. Okay. Um, if Floco, Partizan, Virtus, or any other best EuroCup team was in the EuroLeague now, uh, where they would be in the standings? See, I think um, I would say in that 7 to 12 range, um, I'd see teams in that level of um, in, uh, Munich, Asbel, Finner, Monaco level. Um, but you also have to remember with a yearly bid, um, that means you get a more positional debt because you get more money for sponsors. Um, it allows you to have a bigger roster. Um, but I think all three of those teams you name have star power. They have guys who have yearly talent. They have guys who will have yearly offers and the decision to play yearly if they want. And I think local inverters will be great um, offensively in the yearly because they just have elite offenses. But I think they would struggle some on defense. And I think Partizan will be solid on defense. Um, and I think offensively they would be middle of the pack. Um, but I think those three teams are at that level. Yeah, I agree. I also think that they will be chasing for the playoff spot. And as as you mentioned, there are some seven or eight teams, clear top eight teams. But other than that, uh, the race for the playoffs is, is very close and all these best EuroCup teams would be uh, there uh, as well. And for the end, all EuroCup team starting five, that would be that would have the best shot at making the EuroLeague Final Four. And this starting five have to uh, has to include you as the shooting guard uh, on, on that team or the point guard, uh, as you wish. And you have to build around the starting five around yourself, but you cannot uh, pick any of your teammates. And also, you can pick only one player from one team. Mm. Well, that's tough, too, Miss, because oh, I would love to pick some of my teammates. <laughs> but, uh, all right, at point guard, I will go Justin Cobbs. Um, he's at Budignos. He's averaging 18 and 5, great slasher, good in the mid-range, gets to the free throw line. He's been a surprise for Bruno. They're, they're playing great. Um, they were first in a group until they dropped the game last week. And, you know, I think he'd be a good table setter who could also score. Myself at the shooting guard, four level score from the mid range, from the three and the paint. Also get to the free throw line. Um, I'm a guy who I think demands a double team that, you know, could score and create. I've been a little in 24 and four. Um, number three would be Jaron Jaron Blossom game um, at home. He's averaging 14 and 7. I like my 3 and D guys. Um, he's a 37% three-point shooter. He's athletic. He can defend and finish above the rim. And surprisingly, Ohm has been having a really good season. He's a guy I think that will continue to rise up the ranks in Europe. At the four position, Kevin Harvey. Um, and he's just special to me. I think you know, this is a guy that averages 16 points, uh, four rebounds, can really shoot the ball, can play the five or the four position or the three. Um, really athletic, to run the floor. He was Vitris Bologna's best player this year um, until the injury. And he can guard one through five, and I love his activity. He's a Euro League player for sure if he wants, um, or he can continue to stay at Bologna where he's making very good money as well. And at five, it will surprise you. Um, not sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but I want to say Jessel Rivero from Valencia. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've watched, I've watched his game. Um, he's a guy that's averaging 12 points, five rebounds three offensive rebounds a game, you know, so, you know, with this lineup, we need a guy who brings energy, who's good on pick and roll offense with me and Kyle playing a pick and roll. who's also um, good at um, defense in a pick and roll. And he can also shoot the mid range and step out and intentionally hit the three. If Kevin Harvey has a mismatch on the inside and he wants to go in there, but um, to me, he's really good, really good mid range shooter. And, you know, he was impressive also in Burgos last season. And I like what he brings to that team and that dynamic. Yeah, actually, I had I had him after uh, Motley uh, because I, I picked him as my center. I also had uh, Teodosic, Punter, Aaron Harrison. I would try to play him as my uh, free man, and I had a hard time on finding a good uh, stretch for for my lineup. So um, I didn't find any 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 good answer uh, for that position. Anyway. Uh, kudos to Lokomotiv, actually. You mentioned Kevin Harvey. If not Teodosic on my lineup, I, Kevin Harvey would be a clear solution for the position four. But 
I just can go through the list of amazing players who debuted in the in Europe, who made, uh, who came from overseas, and who started their career in Europe uh, here in local, local. And uh, in 2018 or 19, it was Alan Williams, then Kevin Harvey, and now Motley uh, joined local. So that's a great job by uh, local motives scouting department, let's say, or Vice President Ginas Rutkauskas or, or the boss of the club, uh, Vedishev. They're finding great, great overseas players that they're coming here and they're just blossoming later at uh, the years here in Europe. Yeah, they do an excellent job at that. Um, you know, we got the Lithuanian connection. My guy, Guinness, uh, you know, he, he's going to the G League showcases. He's you know, constantly scouting. You know, he's an excellent GM. You know, this is a guy who watches every single practice, travels with us on road games. Well, yeah, I told him, I was like, uh, you're you're a different GM. I was like, most well, GMs, you know, they they'll come to the good cities. Uh, you know, my experience, I say, but you're everywhere. I said, he's, I gotta watch. You know, in case one of you guys is agents call and I say, why I'm not playing, and you know, I can actually give you insight on what you're doing, what you're not. But you know, he does a great job, Scott. I, I even asked him. I said, how did you find Jonathan Motley, and how did you get him to come here? <laughs> and then um, even another good signing they got was Darius Thompson. Um, mm-hmm. Great pickup. Um, he's adjusted well to this level he's, he's going to be extreme talent um he's a yearly level pg yeah. six foot five can create like logo they're doing a great job scouting they're finding guys and you know i i think local is a high level club but they're also great for you springboarding your career for a lot of these younger guys who are you know trying to establish yourself in europe and i think um people will know darius thompson and people will know jonathan motley uh, so just remember those names and continue to monitor and watch the progress because they are elite players yeah, and just for the preview, uh, this week we have some exciting games in the EuroLeague. Uh, we also have some rescheduled games, including Real Madrid against Unix Kazan on Tuesday. That will be a hell of a game. On Thursday, we will have Zenit uh, FS, and on Friday, Monaco, Real Madrid, and Unix CSKA. That will be a hell of a matchup for, for Unix because they've uh, won both games against CSKA, and the last one in the EuroLeague was a 21 point win with having a lead of 29 points uh, during the third quarter or something like that so we will uh, we will see if uh, Tsk will be will manage uh, to make a revenge let's say so who's, an exciting who's the home team who's the home team for that? I think I think Unix yeah Unix Ooh, oh that's tough Jessica. that's tough yeah, so an exciting <laughs> week, an exciting week in the EuroLeague. It will be interesting week for you guys as well because you're playing Letkabelis in the Euro Cup, uh, and you you're missing both Motley and uh, Stanton Kid uh, because they're both out of uh, due to injuries. So it won't be easy because Letkabelis no, are doing great. Yeah, they're my hometown team. So this time I cannot wish you a lot of luck uh, for the upcoming <laughs> weekends. Unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, they're a strong team. I really like how they play together. They fight. They're really good defensively. Uh, you know, they take all the the big teams to the to the wire. I think we beat them by two points last time. I think they lost to Partizan by one. Um, we, we're going to have our hands full, and they come out motivated. It's going to be a tough fall game. I think last time we played them, I was very sore. You know, the Lithuania mm-hmm. physical caliber game, but I'm looking forward to the challenge and. Uh, I hope we can still be friends if our team gets the desired result. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I hope that we will have another podcast uh, later <laughs> into the season. That was a that was a great conversation, Eric. Uh, just just uh, the same like it was uh, before the season, talking about your personal life, uh, your career. Now it was a big pleasure to share some basketball conversation with you, talking about the EuroLeague action. So, yeah, I hope to have you here uh, later this season as well. No, oh, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. You know, always nice during the podcast and having a conversation with you. But for sure, we'll have to do it again if you have some time. Yeah, that's all, folks. Uh, thanks a lot for listening to or viewing us uh, talking about basketball. You can follow us on basketnews.com website and all the YouTube channel as well, uh, basketnews.com, and all the main audio platforms, including Spotify, Podbean. Uh, uh, Apple pass uh, Apple podcasts or any other platform you're you're listening to your podcast so see you next time